Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is a program where you meet the most interesting people who are doing the most important things. It's on camera right now. He is Brigadier General Alfred Abramson, Commanding General of a an interesting place called Picatinny Arsenal, yes. located in Dover, New Jersey. You guys do amazing stuff. What is it? We do. We do fantastic stuff. Picatinny, really, I call it the center of excellence for lethality, right? So we're in the military, and I wear an Army uniform, but not only the center of excellence for lethality for the Army, but really the center of excellence for all services, the Department of Defense Services. So we have Navy folks there, we have Marine mm -hmm. folks there, and we do the munitions, when I talk about munitions, talk about guns and ammunition mm. that go out to our war fighters. Na uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine folks receive the munitions that we manage at Picatinny Arsenal. It is being argued by many who know more about war than I do that yes. wars are being fought so differently largely because of technology. Oh, absolutely. Talk about it. So and then this connection to Picatinny. Sure. So technology really is moving out faster. And so what we have to do in the Department of Defense is our ability to keep up with the change of the technology, which equates to the change of the threat that we need to engage upon. And so a quick example is I say that our munitions are getting smarter. Meaning, so we know when we fire a munition, it knows where it is in time and space on the battlefield. About 10 to 15 years ago, you would fire a munition, whether it's a mortar round or an artillery round, and you would kind of gauge it based off of the propellant that you were using mm. to hit a spot. But now we fire it, it looks, it, it acquires a GPS satellite uh, signal, and we'll go to that particular target. How does it change? How has what you're describing changed the way the Army prepares yeah. to engage yeah. uh, in warfare and also the impact it has on men and women right. who are in the Army itself? Uh, so, so exactly to I know the... it's a complicated question, but I'm thinking about that. No, yeah, but so uh, the Army has to change to keep up with the threat, the pace of play, the pace of change, the speed of relevancy. And so the Army is undergoing what they call the Army Futures Command. We are in the process of standing that up. And that is only going to focus on modernizing the Army for the future. Does it change the jobs in the Army? doesn't change the jobs in the Army, but it gives a focus on effort, a unity of effort. So Modernization the Futures Command really is going to focus efforts all on what is that Army for the future. Today, one would argue or one would offer that there are different directorates and different organizations that are all going to the Army for the future, but now we're going to truncate that and compress it under one command, one flag, one individual, and their sole mission in life is to build a more lethal army faster for the future. Terrorist threats have a big impact on what you guys do at Picatinny? Terrorist threats do shape some of the decisions that we make in terms of investments for weapon systems. And by the way, once we get that weapon system to address that terrorist threat, sometimes it changes. And so that gets to the speed of change of information and and maintaining relevancy on the weapon system. There's a STEM component to this. There is Science, a STEM technology, component. Science, technology, engineering, and math. There right. is a STEM Pick component. Tenny. Talk about it. Absolutely. So STEM component, we have a very robust, a very small team uh, that does Herculean efforts that reaches out to the kids, the children, uh, in the surrounding communities and as far as away as New York. And what that does is it creates an environment to make these children or help these children to be productive citizens in society. Society. How do you do that? How do you do you that? Give us an example of how you do I'll it. I'll give you an example. So uh, yesterday, I, not yesterday, last week we went to a school. The name escapes me. I think it was Boone Town. Booten. Booten. I think that's not the name of the school, but it's something like that. And a um, group of kids have interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We have science and engineers that are on the arsenal mm. because so sponsoring the STEM efforts at the school, and oh, by the way, we have about 70 schools that we sponsor. It's not only about sponsorship for funding and getting them to places, but it's also about investment in the human capital, getting those scientists and engineers out of or off of the arsenal into the schools, talk about projects, 
bring them on to the arsenal and show real life application of the science, technology, engineering, and math applications? And how does that apply to real world environments? My sources tell me you're also doing this with really little kids. We're doing it with really little kids. How young? Actually, it's fantastic. It's as <laughs> young as five years old. And so I was naive. I did not realize that there was a culture out there, a culture, I'll define it as a culture, of this STEM effort that really is out of Picatinny. And we really are touching those children at five years old. It really is creating a problem for them to solve. And so what are we doing? When we create a problem for a group of kids to solve, we trick them. Because what has to happen is they have to understand the problem, they have to work together, they have to develop teamwork, somebody has to be a leader. And so someone might not have the skill set in terms of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but someone may have the ability to be a marketer, even at the age of five, mm -hmm. to talk about the problems that this particular group is solving to the adults. And so what we're doing, when I say tricking them, we are at a very early age teaching them how to be productive citizens in society. And if it pays off, because of that interaction with Picatinny, we are seeding or uh, feeding the pipeline mm -hmm. that they may be future workforce folks that come into Picatinny. Uh, Not necessarily in the military, but can be defense uh, civilians. We have about 6,500 folks on Picatinny. The bulk of them are civilians. So, Brigadier General yep. Abramson, I want to ask you this. Yep. You've been in uh, this military life for how long? 28 years in July. I would be, time. I would be remiss if I did not ask you, as yep. a student of leadership, yes. and I say this to a lot of folks who are watching, yeah. um, we do actually, actually do a, a radio program with uh, some partners at uh, AM 970 Radio yes. um, called the Leadership Hour, and yes. I ask folks who are real leaders the most significant lesson that they have learned about leadership, and given your extraordinary leadership roles wow. in the military, I have to ask you, number one lesson you've learned about leadership is? You have to be yourself. No matter where you are, um, always integrity, right? They always talk about integrity, but one of the things that I've learned is I have to be myself. So if I try to be somebody that I am not, so there can be a Patton, and, and there can be a McChrystal, and there can be a General Shinseki, and there can be a General Milley, and what I do is I take some of General those... General Colin Powell. Oh, General Colin Powell, and I can take nuggets of knowledge of their leadership, but I can't be them. I have to be myself and roll those into an Al Abramson personality and be the leader who I am. Because if I try to be somebody different and I forget about it, the next day mm. I am who I am. I, I got to follow up. Yeah. You grew up in Brownsville, Brownsville section Brooklyn. of Brooklyn. Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Did you learn anything about leadership in Brownsville? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I knew I'd get you. <laughs> yes, Come I on, did. right? I sure did. It helps. It does help. It does help. It, an example? Well, I would say leadership within Brownsville, you have to build, uh, I would say, partners. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yeah. Coming from Brick City, Newark, New Jersey, I would say yeah. partnerships and relationships Real, that help us every survive and do day. what we got to do. Brigadier General Al Abramson, who is commanding General Picatinny Arsenal, I want to yeah. thank you for joining us. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. And most importantly, thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll All be right, right back okay. one on one right after this. Okay. Brownsville. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Summit Medical Group, Rowan University, New Jersey Sharing Network, the law firm of Gibbons PC, TD Bank, Suez, and by Kessler Foundation, Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by Observer New Jersey Politics. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.